Exploration, Discovery, and Settlement of the United States. This lecture is going to cover from the 1400s through the 1600s up until the point where the 13 colonies were established. And uh, in the next lecture, we'll be talking about colonial America. Uh, so last time we talked about indigenous America, what the modern day United States was like before Columbus, before European exploration, discovery, and settlement. And today uh, we are going to talk about the early years of that exploration, discovery, and settlement by Europeans in the New World. And we're actually going to start today's lecture in probably an unexpected place, China. Now, I'll explain why later. It'll become clear in a moment why we're starting here. Um, but the first person to learn about is a guy named Zheng He. Zheng He was a Chinese mariner, great mariner, uh, voyager, who between 1405 and 1433 led seven voyages throughout the Indian Ocean. Uh, he lived at the time of the Ming Dynasty. You can see on the map there all of the places that he traveled to. And he did not travel for the purpose of settlement. He traveled for the purpose of exploration, trade, and also to collect tribute. He would arrive on the shores with his 300 massive ships and his 27,000 crew members and basically intimidate them into um, paying tribute to the Ming Dynasty. So these were seven voyages over the course of these three decades. And as you see there at the top, his ships were absolutely massive. Sometimes they had as many as nine masts. And just as a comparison, you see here, this is the Santa Maria which Christopher Columbus sailed on to reach the New World. And the Santa Maria wasn't small, but here it is seen compared to just one of Zheng He's 300 uh, ships. All right. Now, his voyages were about connecting China with the rest of the world. This was a big part of the Indian Ocean uh, trade network. And the Chinese really became the world leaders in naval technology and quite honestly dominated trade in the Indian Ocean. Uh, throughout the 1400s. And a big question then is, well, if this is the 1400s, okay, Christopher Columbus discovered America in 1492, why didn't the Chinese discover America first? I mean, if they had these massive ships, if they had way better naval technology, uh, they were just an ocean away, the Pacific Ocean, just like the Europeans were the Atlantic Ocean away from the New World. So why didn't the Chinese discover the New World First, well, it has to do with something that happened in China by the end of the 1400s. China essentially abandoned shipbuilding and they abandoned voyages, they abandoned all outreach by the end of the 1400s. And this happened because of a new emperor who took power after his father died in the Ming Dynasty. And he believed that China was going to lose its culture and lose its strength if it continued to reach out to the rest of the world and explore. So he actually made it a punishable offense to build a ship with more than two masts. Uh, the other ships were docked or destroyed and China stopped outreach. And this isolationism is most uh, clearly shown by the building of the Ming Wall at the time. What we see as the Great Wall of China um, that was built in certain different dynasties. It started with the Han, um, but the largest portion of the wall was built by the Ming Dynasty, and that kind of shows their isolationism at the time. Now, if this emperor had not abandoned the building of ships and voyages, it's almost certain that China would have discovered the Americas before Europeans did. And just think about how different the modern-day United States would be if that had happened. So here's a map of the world. And just imagine if from China to the US, if this voyage had been made either by Zheng He or one of the mariners after him, if this voyage had been made before Columbus's voyage right here, the Chinese would have settled the new world first instead of Europeans. Think about how different America would be. Our government would likely be not a constitutional republic because that was influenced by the European Enlightenment. 
Uh, the dominant religion would likely not be Christianity. It might be Confucianism or Taoism or Buddhism from East Asia. The languages we speak, our customs, would be entirely different if that one emperor uh, had continued the voyages and the Chinese had discovered America first. But that did not happen. Columbus was the first to make lasting contact between Afro-Eurasia and the New World. So here's just a map of some of the big voyages that took place leading up to Columbus and then Columbus's voyages himself. So first we see the Silk Road here in the blue. This is the Silk Road that connected China with the Mediterranean region. Um, that was very much in use uh, still at this time, uh, although it was starting to decline now that the Mongols had declined. And in this region right here, as we'll talk about in uh, the next page, the Europeans were, uh, it was dangerous for Europeans to sail here, let's say, because you had two great empires, the Ottoman Empire, which was right here, they very much dominated Indian Ocean trade, and in the early 1400s, you had the Chinese dominating Indian Ocean trade until they abandoned the building of ships. So you had the Chinese dominating the Indian Ocean, and then you had the Ottomans dominating the Indian Ocean in the late 1400s. And so this was uh, a difficult place for Europeans to sail. So why did they even want to sail there? Well, they wanted to trade with China, and traditionally they would go across the Silk Road right here. But by this point, the Ottoman Empire, which was right here, had essentially dominated and uh, monopolized trade along the Silk Road, and they only allowed countries they were allied with in Europe to trade along this route. And the only country they were allied with at the time was Italy. So Italy had a very robust uh, trading system. They traded a lot with the Ottomans and were able to trade all the way to China and back. Uh, for example, Marco Polo was from Italy and he was able to go from China uh, back to his, his hometown of Venice. And uh, Italy is where the Renaissance started too because it grew so wealthy from that trade. But what this meant is that the rest of Europe... France, Portugal, Spain, England, they were not able to trade with China anymore along the Silk Road. So they had to find a different route to China. So this is where the Portuguese, starting with Prince Henry the Navigator, followed by uh, Bartholomew Diaz and Vasco da Gama, they attempted to find a water route. So they sailed to the southern Cape of Africa, the Cape of Good Hope, and sailed to India. Vasco da Gama sailed to India to be exact. Um, but like I said, it was fairly dangerous due to what's called the Omani European rivalry with the Ottoman Turks who were plying the seas and trying to make them all their own. So it was Columbus who said, you know what? We know the earth is round. That was a common misconception. He knew the earth was round. Uh, and he said, so why don't we just sail west and we should hit Asia right around here. Now, even though he knew the Earth was round, he thought it was a lot smaller than it was. He didn't realize how vast the oceans were between Europe and Asia. And he certainly didn't know that these were, there were these two massive continents in, uh, in the way. So just to recap what I just said, mid-1400s, European maritime technology had improved to make lengthy ocean voyages possible uh, for really the first time. And more than anything, they wanted to trade with East Asia. East Asia had the largest population. They had the best technology. They had things like silk, which nobody else had. They had gunpowder, all sorts of very desirable trade goods uh, and luxury items that Europeans wanted. But as we talked about, the Silk Road was no longer an option for most Europeans. And therefore, they tried to get a different route, tried to find a different route to Asia, a maritime route route, a water route. Most natural option was to go around the Cape of Africa uh, through the Indian Ocean. The first Portuguese um, leader to recognize the importance of seafaring was Prince Henry the Navigator. He started to fund seafaring expeditions, uh, one of the first European leaders to do that. Uh, Bartholomew Diaz was the first European to sail around the southern tip of Africa. Uh, he then returned home. And then following him, Vasco da Gama went all the way around Africa and all the way to India. So that was a very big voyage, important voyage for European exploration. 
Um, but then, as I said, the Omani-European rivalry developed in which Ottoman ships would ply the Indian Ocean in an attempt to monopolize Indian Ocean trade, and it made it dangerous for Europeans to take this route to Asia. Then, an Italian man named Christopher Columbus had the idea to go west. So who was Christopher Columbus? Well, he was an Italian explorer, and he wanted to find a more direct route and a safer route, honestly, from Europe to Asia, then going around the southern Cape of Africa, through the Indian Ocean and the Straits of Malacca. So he and his crew did know that the Earth was round. Um, Columbus just thought it was much smaller and believed that there was just ocean between the western coast of Europe and the eastern coast of Asia. Of course, he was mistaken. Now, even though Christopher Columbus was Italian, the Italian leaders would not fund his expedition. And the reason why they wouldn't fund his expedition was because they saw it as completely unnecessary. Remember, the Italians had a great relationship with the Ottoman Empire, and therefore they could trade with China along the Silk Road. So they didn't need these expensive uh, explorations to discover new routes to Asia. They already had uh, a great gig going. So he asked the monarchs of Spain. Spain was one of the European countries that um, had very good naval technology, but they were not able to uh, use the Silk Road. So the monarchs of Spain, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella, they agreed to fund Columbus's expedition. And they decided to do this for three reasons. They're known as the three G's, glory, God, and gold. All right, uh, glory to bring glory to their empire and uh, make them competitive and relevant with their rivals, uh, and to also make them remembered by history, which clearly worked. Uh, two, God, to, um, to spread the gospel to nations that had not heard the gospel preached before and uh, hopefully save their, their souls. And then third would be gold, to obtain riches from a new world, not just in trading, but also in acquiring, maybe mining gold. And those were all of the reasons why Ferdinand and Isabella uh, gave Columbus the funds and the needed ships to sail west across the Atlantic, hopefully to find another route to Asia. So Columbus set off on his voyage that no other European had uh, accomplished with three ships, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria. He had to uh, combat um, mutinies on his route because at some point they were going for so long. Remember, he thought that they would reach Asia around here, but they didn't. It was just more and more sea, and their crew members thought that they would basically be trapped there forever and, and never be able to see home again. And around here, they ran out of... Uh, supplies for a return back, and he had to um, stop a mutiny. And then, right before they were forced to turn back, he reached land. Uh, 1492, um, remember Columbus had very little technology to guide him. Yes, he had nice ships, but he also did not have, you know, what, what mariners today or even centuries after him had. Um, he basically had uh, some inaccurate maps and a compass. And so he was a very skilled navigator to be able to discover such a land. As he sailed west, the first place that he landed was a Caribbean island named San Salvador, uh, right around here, uh, near the modern-day Bahamas. Uh, no, he did not ever um, set foot in the modern-day United States, um, but he did discover the Caribbean islands for Europeans. Now, when he landed here, he thought that he had landed in the East Indies, or modern-day Indonesia, and therefore he called the people that he encountered Indians. And this is why the Caribbean islands would later become known as the West Indies, or the islands in the West, in, contrary to, uh, in contrast to the Indies in the East. Okay, So that is why Native Americans were originally given the name Indians. This discovery... Um, affected both Columbus and the Spanish monarchs and really all of Europe. Uh, now, very few spices were found. Not much gold was found by Columbus and, and his men, a little bit, but, but not that much. Um, so they were a bit disappointed. Conversion did occur, conversion of uh, Native Americans to Christianity. But Columbus would go on three more journeys to North America, and that would be uh, where he died as well, in the Caribbean. He began to establish colonies there for the Spanish and other 
voyagers followed him. So if you look at uh, this map here, look at all of these different voyagers from Spain, from France, from England, from Holland, um, all followed Columbus and explored the Americas. Immediately once Columbus came back and um, spread the word about this new land, people wanted to follow, to strike it rich, to convert people to Christianity and to bring glory to themselves and to their country. Now, there was a European about 500 years before Columbus named Leif Erikson. He was a Viking, and he was actually the first European to ever set foot in the Americas. Around 1000 AD, he landed right around here in modern-day Canada, uh, but he stayed here for about a year, went back to Greenland, and died. Uh, he didn't really spread the news about it, and, didn't, and this did not lead to lasting uh, European contact with the New World, because... The vast majority of Europeans didn't know about Leif Erikson, didn't know that he had discovered a new world. In fact, Erikson himself wasn't so sure what it was that he had discovered. So Columbus, while he was much later, his voyages were much more important to world history because they led to the first lasting European contact with the Americas. And this ushered in this time of exploration, conquest, and colonization that lasted for centuries. His discovery really opened up the Americas to Europeans and changed the course of world history. It, for the first time, bridged the divide between the Americas and Afro-Eurasia, which previously had been developing in complete and total isolation. So Europeans deemed these new regions that they had recently discovered the New World. They called North and South America the New World, and the Old World was the term given to Europe, Africa, and Asia. So when we um, use those terms, make sure you know what we mean, the old world and the new world. One really important um, effect of Columbus's discovery and the continued exploration back and forth from the Atlantic was called the Columbian Exchange, or the new trade route that opened up as a result of Columbus's discovery. So these new forms of trade and globalization that occurred after 1492, known as the Columbian Exchange, led to the spreading of animals, plants, diseases, and people from one side of the world to the other. So just to make this clear, um, before 1492, there were some plants and animals that had only existed, that only were around in the Americas, and that Europeans and Africans and Asians had never seen before. For example, uh, the pumpkin and the potato, the tomato, uh, corn. No European had ever heard of a potato before uh, discovering the New World. Similarly, there were a lot of um, plants and animals that only existed in the Old World that had never been seen by Native Americans before, such as bananas and cows uh, and sugar, uh, all of which became uh, very um, profitable uh, industries in the New World once plantations started to be developed. Um, some more examples of new foods that Europeans brought to the Americas would be wheat and grapes, and this also coincides with the spreading of ideas to the New World, most importantly Christianity. Um, still to this day, North and South America, Central America, and the Caribbean are still largely Christian, and that started with the Colombian Exchange bringing Christianity to uh, the New World. And wheat and grapes, those are both used to make the bread and the wine of Holy Communion. And so that is one way that um, Christianity traveled across the Atlantic. Uh, similarly, the New World introduced corn, beans, potatoes, tomatoes, avocados, uh, turkeys uh, to the New World things that Europeans and um, Africans and Asians had never seen or heard of before. And they became staples of the diets over there. Um, for example, Ireland became known for their potatoes. But before 1492, no Irishman had ever seen or eaten a potato. Um, Italy became very well known for their tomatoes. If you ever go to an Italian restaurant, just count how many items on the restaurant have tomatoes in it. Well, before 1492, no Italian had ever seen a tomato. So the Colombian Exchange, one of the effects, one of the positive effects was that it led to the spread of more food. It increased the world's food supply because a lot of these crops grew very well in the lands they were introduced to. 
and it decreased uh, hunger. It decreased world hunger, uh, permanently decreased starvation, in fact, um, because of all the new foods and the increase in food supply. However, on the more negative side, one thing that the Colombian exchange did was exchange diseases. And I'm sure you guys know how immunity works. Um, your body develops antibodies that can fight off infections, but only after they have been exposed to that infection, only after they have been exposed to that germ. And if you've never been in contact with a, uh, a germ of a disease that to most people w wouldn't really be that bad, it could kill you. And that's exactly what happened to the majority of the Native American population. Over 50% of the population, the Native population in the Americas died of diseases brought over by Europeans. Uh, the worst was smallpox. There was a massive smallpox epidemic that broke out once Native Americans came into contact with Europeans, even Europeans who were well-meaning and didn't mean to you know, spread these diseases. That is what happened. Um, no person in the Inca or Aztec empire had ever been within a, a thousand miles of a smallpox germ. And now they are being uh, bombarded with them measles, mumps, other sorts of diseases, and this led to a decimation of the native population of the New World. Uh, it led to the end of the Inca and Aztec empires at the hands of Europeans because disease left them with a very small population, a weakened population, and much less equipped for battle, and also their leaders kept dying, and so the Spanish were able to fairly easily come in and conquer the Aztecs in Mexico and the Incas in Peru. Europeans and Africans uh, continued to repopulate the New World after this decimation of the Indian population. The uh, worst part, arguably the worst part of the Colombian exchange was the slave trade, the Atlantic slave trade where Europeans captured uh, Africans and brought them to the New World. And the reason why even the desire for this began was because when Europeans came to the New World, they were able to acquire land. Uh, they either shared land with Native Americans or took it from them. And these European plantations that started in the New World relied on cheap labor. That was the only way they were able to make a profit. And there were two types of cheap labor that were very common. The first one was indentured servitude. These were arrangements through which servants uh, contracted to work. They were contracted to work for a certain number of years, either in exchange for passage to the new world or to pay off a debt to somebody. They would work for them as indentured servants, or maybe they were criminals and were granted freedom if they uh, moved to the New World and, you know, Scotland, the, the prisons were crowded anyway, so they, they, were, they were willing to send them to, uh, to the Americas to work as indentured servants. Um, but one thing that was very different from indentured servitude was chattel slavery. Now, chattel slavery was a system in which individuals were considered to be property, to be bought and sold, literally just like cattle. That's where the term chattel uh, comes from. And indentured servitude was temporary, chattel slavery was permanent. Now initially, Europeans relied on Native Americans and European indentured servants for labor. Native Americans would either be enslaved or would be contracted to work in exchange for uh, maybe land grants or protection from Europeans. However, both European indentured servants and Native Americans had very low life expectancies due to disease. So we already talked about how indigenous Americans had no immunity to diseases that Europeans brought from the New World, and so they kept dying off. Um, but also European servants, mostly uh, from Scotland, Ireland, places like that, they had no immunity to malaria. And malaria, brought over from Africa, became very common in the lowland, humid, hot, sticky fields in places like South Carolina and Virginia and in the Caribbean. So these lowland fields where these European indentured servants lived, um, they did not have immunity to malaria. The climate in Scotland is much different from the climate in Sub-Saharan Africa and the southern United States. It's not hot and humid and therefore 
they had not been exposed to mosquitoes and malaria before. Therefore, they got bitten, had no antibodies, and they would often die too. So Europeans looked to Africa for laborers who would live longer because West Africans had immunity both to malaria and to European diseases. Europeans and Africans had been in contact for thousands of years at this point, and um, malaria had been in Africa for thousands of years at this point as well. So African uh, immune systems were much more accustomed to both of these diseases. So even though African slaves were three times more expensive than Scottish servants, they would live much longer, and therefore economically, some Europeans thought that that was a good investment. So how did this happen? How did 10 million human beings get captured from their homes and then brought across the Atlantic Ocean to a place they've never seen before in order to be slaves for the rest of their lives. Completely a crime against humanity, a tragic injustice, but how did this even happen? Well, it started with the kingdoms in Africa itself. African kingdoms like the Asante Empire and the Kingdom of the Congo, which you see in that map of West Africa there, they took advantage of this European interest in slave labor. And they said, hey, we can profit off of this European desire to gain cheap labor. And so what they did is they would capture their own people or people of rival tribes, other Africans, and they would sell them to Europeans. European traders would set up trading posts along Africa's western coast here, and African civilizations would grow wealthy by agreeing to sell uh, either their own criminals, their own enslaved Africans, or um, people they captured in war or in slave raids, they would sell those human beings to European traders. Now, Europeans kind of rationalize this in their mind by saying, oh, we're just respecting the African system of slavery um, that was in place. And in that way, kind of justified these horrible actions, when in reality, both the Europeans were responsible for this because they were the ones who brought in the demand for slave labor, and the African leaders were responsible for this too. They both bear moral responsibility for the millions of lives that they utterly ruined through the transatlantic slave trade. So when African leaders along the coast um, realized they could economically benefit, they would invade neighboring societies in this quest to bring slaves back to the coast and wait for European ships. So cap captive Africans, they were swept away from their families, they were taken into holding pens on the West African coast known as barracoons or slave castles. And these points of no return were the places where countless Africans saw their homeland for the last time. They would then be in these pens, these barracoons, for weeks at a time. Then when a European ship came into port, the Africans and the European traders would haggle about a price, so many barrels of rum for so many African slaves, or so much tobacco, so many firearms for a hundred slaves, something like that, and then they would be brought onto the boat. Um, they would be crammed into the dank cargo sections of these slave ships. And as you see on the aerial view there of what a slave ship looked like, they would be packed in like sardines. The average slave had had just four square feet of space. They were literally shoulder to shoulder, sometimes chest to back, like on their sides, almost as if they were spoons. And four square feet of space, guys, that's less than a coffin. I mean, unless you were a very, very small person, like a child, and yes, sometimes children were taken, um, you would be incredibly cramped the entire time you were there. Um, there were many attempted rebellions at sea. Most were unsuccessful. Some Africans jumped overboard to die uh, during this grueling journey across the Atlantic called the Middle Passage. You might ask, how did they, you know, how were they able to get on board to jump overboard? Well, every few days, the, um, the slave traders on the ship, they would bring up the slaves one group at a time, like maybe 20 at a time on board. Um, they, would, um, they would unshackle them for a moment so that they could exercise them. They would literally bring them above deck, play a drum or a, a fiddle or, or something like that to make them dance. And if they didn't want to dance, they would whip their feet until they did in order to 
prevent their muscles from atrophying. And this was not because they wanted to keep them healthy for their own benefit. It was because they knew that they wouldn't get a good price at the slave auction if the um, enslaved Africans' uh, muscles had deteriorated and they weren't healthy at all. Uh, nonetheless, many, many people died on this uh, horrific journey. I mean, if you could just imagine the smell down there, um, there were no restrooms, okay? They didn't, they weren't allowed to go above deck and go in a bucket and, and, and you know, uh, shove it overboard. They just went. They were chained together. Every time they had to use the restroom, they just went. Imagine the sloshing. Imagine the diseases that you would get because of that. Um, a lot of times the slaves were given European food that they had never had before, and so they would throw up, and that would mix with all the feces, and it was a very, um, very hostile environment to be in, and that's a big reason why so many um, were, uh, so many died on, on the way. Uh, sometimes they would suffocate. I mean, it, it was tough to breathe down there too. And over the course of the 300 years that this middle passage took place, um, with so many different slave ships coming in, about 10% of all the slaves, 10 to 15% of all the slaves died even before they got to the new world. So this was all a part of what was called the triangular trade. So this was the middle leg, uh, the middle passage uh, of the triangular trade. So European factured goods like firearms would be shipped to um, would be shipped to Africa, and then um, from Africa, slaves would come to the Americas, and from the Americas, you'd get tobacco or sugar or something uh, traveling to Europe, and then it would keep going in this triangle that was very profitable for the people running it, but like I said, ruined tens of millions of lives on the way. The uh, trip to the New World would last anywhere from six weeks to three months, and during this time, up to half of a ship's captives might die, depending on how tightly they packed them in uh, to try to get as much profit as they could. This dispersion of people out of Africa is called the African diaspora. Diaspora means a dispersion of people from a certain location to a place that's not their home, and this was a forced one. Now, only about 5% of slaves that were taken from Africa were transported to the modern-day United States. Most of them were taken to Brazil and to the Caribbean, where they were treated even more harshly than they were treated in the U.S. They were treated worse in Brazil and parts of the Caribbean, um, so barbarically, in fact, that a slave's life expectancy was only 23 years old. They often would not live past their 20s because of these brutal methods that were, um, that were handed down by the white minority in order to control the slave majority and prevent uprisings. That's why they felt the need. That's why the white minority in the Caribbean and, the, and Brazil felt the need to be more brutal than white Americans did because white Americans were always in the majority and therefore slave revolts weren't as big of a threat. But in, for example, Jamaica, 90% of the population is African slaves and therefore the small percentage of the population that was the white slave owners they were extremely brutal to their slaves in order to scare them, intimidate them into not um, revolting. Now, since slaves were treated less cruelly in the United States, still badly, but less cruelly compared to in Brazil and the Caribbean, um, the slave population grew in America um, because most slaves lived long enough to get married and have children, and therefore the population grew uh, to around 4 million by the end of the Civil War, uh, whereas in Brazil and the Caribbean, they continued to feel the need for a constant resupply of slaves from Africa to replace those who were dying off because of their cruelty. Now, European colonies in the New World. Spain and Portugal were the first countries to um, colonize the New World. If we're talking about 1492 until the late 1500s, for the first century of New World exploration, discovery, and settlement. It was really Spain and Portugal that did most of the settling really throughout the 1500s. Spain conquered all that territory you see on the map in the red. Uh, they conquered the Aztecs with the leadership of the conquistador Hernan Cortes, uh, and they established the Viceroyalty of New Spain in 1521. 
This encompassed Mexico, Central America, and about half of the modern-day United States. Spain then conquered the Incan Empire and established the Viceroyalty of Peru, which you see in South America there. And this was established in 1542. The conquistador who did this was Francisco Pizarro. And this encompassed all of South America except for Brazil, which was ruled by Portugal. So in order to prevent a war between Portugal and Spain, Portugal and Spain signed a treaty called the Treaty of Tordesillas, in which they drew a line down the Americas right there. And they said everything to the west of that line um, is going to be Spanish territory, and everything to the east of that line is going to be Portuguese territory, which you see Brazil there. Now, um, that's why Brazil today speaks Portuguese, and the rest of South America speaks Spanish, because that uh, is who colonized those regions. Now, this might seem super unfair to Portugal, but uh, Portugal had a trading post empire in um, Africa and in Southeast Asia as well. So that also meant that they wouldn't have Spanish competition there. So the Spanish conquistadors like Cortes, uh, de Soto, and Ponce de Leon, after their conquest, they searched for gold. And in the process, they did find some gold, but they also found a huge number of silver mines, especially in the Andes Mountains. So Spanish silver mining in the Americas made Spain the richest country in Europe during the 1500s. Uh, but the Spanish spent most of this newfound wealth on waging wars. They spent it very irresponsibly. And this all came to a head with the Spanish Armada, which was a fleet of 130 silver-funded silver Spanish ships sailing up to England to try to conquer England, and uh, England conquered them. They, they um, defeated them in battle, I should say, and two-thirds of these ships sunk to the bottom of the ocean, and with it, Spain's wealth dwindled by the end of the 1500s, and England kind of replaced Spain as one of the uh, dominant countries in the New World coming into the 1600s. So, 16th, uh, 1600s, England and France really started to challenge Spain and Portugal in the New World. Uh, France, encouraged by King Louis XIV, the Sun King, um, th they explored North America and claimed the land that they discovered, um, which you see in the pink there, as New France. England's first successful colony was Jamestown, Virginia. This was in 1607. Um, a second was established in Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620, and then Massachusetts Bay Colony was established in 1630, and this area became known as New England. So Jamestown in particular. In 1497, an English explorer named John Cabot explored the east coast of North America for England, and he came back and reported what he found. But England was not very powerful or rich at the time. They lacked the funds, they lacked the technology to settle or trade in the New World. Then, by 1588, England had conquered the Spanish Armada. They had become a major naval power. They had become much more formidable on the world stage, and so they had the ability to sail across the ocean and settle. Also in this period, England's population was rapidly growing, and putting stress on its economy, which was becoming very depressed. So this led to a lot of peasants being willing to risk the voyage across the ocean in order to gain riches and land that they weren't allowed to gain in England, but might be able to in the New World. Then in 1607, King James I chartered the Virginia Company, named after the Virgin Queen, uh, Queen Elizabeth I, who came right before him. She was called that because she never got married or had kids. Uh, the Virginia Company was a joint stock company that was formed to finance the first English settlement in North America. Uh, the first settlers of Jamestown uh, suffered Indian attacks, famine, disease, nearly wiped out the entire colony. Um, the Powhatan Indians in particular um, were very brutal to the English settlers at Jamestown, killed off about three quarters of the population, and uh, some believe that they wouldn't even survive the winter. Um, but then, through the forceful leadership of Captain John Smith and the establishment of a tobacco industry by Englishman John Rolfe and his Native American wife, Pocahontas, uh, Jamestown was able to survive and grow into the prosperous royal colony of Virginia. 
Now, while settlers at Jamestown migrated mostly for economic reasons, a group of uh, religious people named Puritans, they set sail in order to gain religious freedom from the Church of England, which they believed had become too Catholic and too impure. So Puritans were called that because they were strict moralists. They wanted to purify the Church of England from Catholic influences. Now, they were very much persecuted by King James I, and that's why they wanted to leave. Uh, one group of Puritans called Separatists wanted to leave Spain in search of religious, sorry, not leave Spain, leave England in search of religious uh, liberty. And these pilgrims, called pilgrims because a pilgrimage is a religious journey, these pilgrims first went to Holland or the Netherlands, but they were met with cultural and economic hardships. So they said a better bet would be to set sail for Virginia, for the New World. So in 1620, a hundred pilgrims set sail for Virginia aboard the Mayflower. The captain was Miles Standish, and the governor of the future Plymouth Colony was William Bradford. This was a two-month voyage. It was very stormy, very tumultuous, and because of that, the ship arrived not in Virginia, but a few hundred miles north of Virginia off the coast of Massachusetts. But instead of setting sail again, the pilgrims decided simply to settle there and establish the new colony of Plymouth. Now, about half of the pilgrims died during the first winter. It was a very brutal winter. Uh, many of them uh, did not survive. Uh, but then in the spring, Native Americans came into contact with the Europeans. They showed them how to farm. They showed them how to survive. Uh, this was mostly uh, Native Americans from the Wampanoag tribe. The great chief Massasoit was in charge. Um, one Indian who first came into contact with the pilgrim, pilgrims was named Samoset, and he introduced them to Squanto, a Native American who actually spoke English and could communicate with the Europeans. The reason he spoke English was because at one point in his life, he traveled to Europe, uh, converted to Christianity, learned the language, and then came back to the New World. Really incredible story Squanto has. But what all this led to was the first harvest in 1621, which led to the first Thanksgiving, in which the uh, Wampanoag Indians and the pilgrims uh, dined together and gave thanks to God uh, for the harvest that they now had, which they didn't have the previous year. So the Plymouth Colony, their economy was very much based on fishing, um, trapping furs, and cutting down lumber. After James I died in England, uh, Charles, his son, became the king and actually increased persecution of Puritans. This is one thing that led to the English Civil War, uh, which led to his beheading. But in 1629, King Charles I, wanting to get rid of the Puritans in his country, he granted them a royal charter to leave England for the New World under the Massachusetts Bay Company. So in 1630, about 1,000 Puritans, led by John Winthrop, they sailed for the Massachusetts shore, landed just north of the Plymouth Colony, and established the Massachusetts Bay Colony. They founded the city of Boston and several other towns that are still around today. Now, during the English Civil War, which was in the 1640s and 50s, King Charles I died. Uh, there was a lot of violence. It was a dangerous time to be in England. And because of that, 15,000 English people fled England and settled in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. So this is what the map of North America looked like uh, circa 1700 or so. Uh, now, one thing I would like to mention here is the fact that this is kind of a European fantasy, um, because as you see, there are no Native American tribal borders on here, uh, but these were the, lames the lands claimed by the British, the French, and the Spanish. So the last thing we're going to talk about is the relations between um, the Europeans and the Indians. So starting with the Spanish. Spanish-Indian relations were overall very, very bad. In the American territories conquered and occupied by Spain, millions of Indians died as a result both of the conquistadors' methods of war as well as efforts at ens enslavement, and mostly, as we talked about, through European diseases that the Indians had no immunity against. Spain incorporated the conquered native peoples of South and Central America into a highly organized empire. Uh, because few families from Spain came to settle in the empire, it was mostly an economic venture for the Spanish, 
Because of that, explorers and Spanish adventurers intermarried with Indians as well as with Africans. And this is largely where we get uh, the ethnic group called Hispanics or Latinos today. The Spanish, in order to maintain their, um, their supposed superiority among the native population, created out of thin air this rigid social hierarchy called the casta system. And they developed this entirely based on race, in which uh, a group called peninsulares, which were those who were born on the Iberian Peninsula in Spain or Portugal, but moved to the New World, they were at the top. Then Creoles or Criollos, who were whites who were born in the Americas, they were next. Beneath them were people of mixed race, um, called Mestizos, who were um, half white, half Native American, Mulattoes, who were half white, half black, and then Zambos, who were half black, half Native American, um, were there, followed by Native Americans, followed by, at the bottom, black Africans. Again, totally made up, but this was the way that the Spanish were able to consolidate power. French-Indian relations were much better. Um, unlike the Spaniards, the French maintained relatively good relations with Indian tribes who occupied New France, the St. Lawrence Valley and the Great Lakes region and the Mississippi River Valley. And a big reason why the French got along much better with the Indians than the Spanish did is because the French motives for being there were much different from the Spanish. Uh, the Spanish wanted to mine silver and create all of these uh, plantations in order to make a lot of money, and that required forced labor, that required taking land from Native Americans, and therefore a lot of conflict and violence happened. But the French didn't want to do that so much. They wanted to explore the land, they wanted to profit from the land, but not by farming or mining, which would have required taking the land, they wanted to make money by hunting and trapping uh, animals to uh, get their furs. For example, uh, example, beaver pelts became one of the major uh, industries, the fur trade, that the French um, engaged in. And because of this, the French were able to share the land with the Indians and had a much better relationship with them. In fact, French soldiers even assisted the Huron people, which is an Indian tribe, in fighting their traditional enemy, the Iroquois, which was another group of, of six Indian tribes. French traders built trading posts along the St. Lawrence River Valley, um, the Great Lakes, and the Mississippi River, where they exchanged French goods, which um, the Indians had never seen before and, and they wanted. They traded those for Indian furs. And because the French had few colonists, few farms, few towns, they didn't really pose much of a threat to the Indians, and so they largely got along with the Indians. And then finally, English-Indian relations. The settlers at Jamestown were met with fierce violence from the Powhatan Indians immediately, and this nearly wiped out the entire colony. And after that, conflict between the English and the Indians continued in Virginia for decades and decades. Now, in Massachusetts, it was a little bit different. In Massachusetts, relations were pretty peaceful and cooperative for the first hundred years of settlement, of European, uh, of English settlement in New England. Indians taught settlers how to grow new crops like corn. Uh, they showed them how to hunt in the forests. They traded furs for English tools and weapons. And overall, it was a very good, positive, healthy um, Christian, you could say, uh, because it was a moral relationship, um, relations with the Indians. Um, but then, unfortunately, in the 1700s, which we'll talk more about next time, um, conflict and war broke out. The English began to view the Indians as primitive savages. Uh, Indians saw their way of life threatened as more and more English settlers arrived and took more and more Indian land. Basically, if land could be shared, usually um, Indians and Europeans got along, but if it required uh, control of land, you know, one group having it over the other, that's when conflict ensued. So by 1733, the 13 colonies had been established and conflict with Indian tribes over the land that the English claimed had really become the norm for American colonists. So this brings us into the colonial period of the English colonies in uh, North America, which we'll talk about in our next lecture.